So first I would like to thank you all for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. A pleasure to meet everyone here on a Friday night far from Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, so what I'm going to do today is talk a little bit about the work I do. I'm in charge of the core facility and mostly what we do is uh, providing services and creating tools for research. So there are two main services that we do, reprogramming and gene editing. I'm going to talk about this. And then these tools are created mostly to do disease modeling. And um, although I don't do the research on disease modeling in the lab, I will give you an example of some research that's been done on this cells that we derive in our core facility. And it will give you a good example, I think, of what can be done with these cells. So I'm, I'm going to start very basic because I don't know if you know a lot about uh, the cells I'm going to talk about today, which are very really important stem cells. These cells have two unique characteristics. One that can self on you, which means that they can grow pretty much forever. So you have an unlimited number of cells. The second characteristic, they are pluripotent, meaning that they can turn into any cell type of the body. So again, in theory, it means that we can get an unlimited number of any cell type, muscles, neurons, cardiac cells, whatever. So where do you find these cells? Well, the first human pluripotent stem cells were derived from embryo by Dr. Jenny Thompson at the University of Wisconsin in 1998. So Dr. Jenny Thompson uh, took extra embryo from IVF clinic. And these embryos are at very early stage, at day five to seven post fertilization So this embryo at this stage, at the, which is called blastocyst, if you take these uh, cells here, the inner cell mass from this embryo and put them in culture, you'd be able to derive very potent stem cells if they're in the right condition. And as I said earlier, these cells can grow forever and can turn into any cell type of the body. Now, one of the issues with this is when you take these cells out of the, of the blastocyst, the embryo is destroyed. So obviously there are some ethical issues regarding this procedure. And there were a lot of efforts that were put in the following years to find a different source of cells to derive human pluripotent stem cells without starting from human embryo. Okay? So, where can we find pluripotent stem cells if we don't start from embryo? One of the problems is that, um, as you know, development is a one way road. At the early stage of the development, the cells have the very large potential. So the cells in the blastocyst, they can turn into any cell type of the body. But as development goes on, the cells get more specialized. And in the adult body, we don't have any more these pluripotent stem cells. We have adult stem cells. For instance, blood stem cells can give rise to any cell, any blood cell type, but you cannot get neurons from that stem cell. You cannot get muscles from that stem cell. So they are more restricted. So obviously we don't have to implant stem cells there, right? And one very good illustration of this is this, sorry, Waddington epigenetic landscape that was um, um, shown by Dr. Waddington in 1957. So the cells um, that are fully differentiated, or the cells here have the same genome, but their epigenetic is different. So the DNA molecules are structured differently, which makes these cells pluripotent and these cells very restrictive. And this is perfectly illustrated here, this uh, marble at the top at the full potential, but the marble here at the bottom, they are very specialized. These cells, they can be only these cells, okay? So, well, how can we get pluripotent stem cells if we can start from embryo then? Well, this is what we call reprogramming. It's like bringing this marble here all the way up the mountain, and I guess the best way is to bring them to a lift at the top of the mountain. So how do we do that? Well, it came up in 2006. This was a big revolution for the field. Dr. Shinya Yamanaka here, show that you can take cells from the adult body, like skin cells, for instance, and just by overexpressing four genes, they are listed here, OP4, SOX2, KDF4, and SEMIC, 
a small percentage of these cells will turn into pluripotent stem cells. Okay, and this pluripotent stem cell, he called them induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS. These cells are very similar to the embryonic stem cells I was telling you about. They can multiply and can grow forever, and they can differentiate into any cell type of the body. So now this is great because we don't need to start from human embryo. We can start from skin cells. So this was uh, published for the first time in 2006, and you might have heard that Dr. Shinya Yamanaka won the Nobel Prize in 2012, so only six years after this discovery. So it can tell you how important this discovery was. So how did he come up with this? I'm just going to show you one slide on this. He said, well, what if we put the genes that are important for the maintenance of human embryonic stem cells into a skin cell? What will happen? Can we change the fate of the cell this way? He started with a list of 24 genes that are listed here, and he just overexpressed this into skin cells. And I should say, at the time, he started with mouse skin cells, not human. And he found a way to, uh, to select for the cells that turn into pluripotent stem cells. I'm not going to go, go through the detail, but when he overexpressed these 24 genes, he was able to get some pluripotent stem cells. So then he went on and remove one by one each one of these 24 to narrow down to four genes. So it's amazing. You can take one cell, overexpress four genes, and it turns into something totally different. And it showed at the time that these cells were pluripotent. This is the way uh, it showed it by um, injecting, injecting this IPS into a mouse embryo and was able to get a mouse with a mix of cells from the IPS and from the original embryo. So this was in 2006. Okay. The following year, and this was in mouse cells, the following year, two um, groups, again, Shinya Yamanaka and Jimmy Thompson uh, in Wisconsin, showed that the same technology could be used to do human IPS. So in this case, it used the four uh, genes that I told you before, of 4, KV4, SOX2, and CEMIC. In this case, it was even a different group of genes. So it shows that you don't even need this four specific gene. It's more broad than what we thought in the first place. The following year, the first two publications showing the derivation of this IPS from a patient with disease were reported, and both of them were from Boston, so Kevin again in our department at Harvard, and George Daly, uh, who is now in the Longwood area at uh, Children's Hospital. So in one of them, it was from patients with ALS, and the second paper, it was um, 10 different patients with different diseases. So again, showing that this is pretty easy to do with so many publications come up in such a short time. So a very, very powerful tool. So why is it powerful? Well, for two reasons. Now you can start with a patient with the disease, in this case, SMN. Take the skin from this patient. You add this four little gene, of four semis, so it's two, of four, uh, and KD4, sorry. And some of these skin cells will turn into IPS. And remember, this IPS come from here, so they have the same genetic than the patient. So now we have IPS that have all the genetic from the SMA patient. So what we can do with this, because they can grow forever, we can make a lot of cells, because they can turn into it into any cell type, well, we can differentiate them into the type of cells that is affected by the disease, in this case, motor neuron. And we can use this motor neuron, one, to understand a little bit more about the mechanism of the disease, and two, very important, very importantly for drug screening. So for companies, this is very interesting now. They can make this motor neuron from all the patients they want and test drugs in a dish. So this is really a big revolution. And ho hopefully we can um, develop new drugs to treat the patient. So this is pretty much one side of the, of the picture, disease modeling. The second side of the picture is cell therapy. I told you these cells are unlimited. 
and they can be differentiated to any, any cell type. So you can think about using these cells to transplant back into the patient. There are two things you have to think about now. If you start with patients that have a mutation, you need to repair the mutation first. And this is now possible with some advances um, on uh, gene editing, and I will tell you more about this in the next few slides as well. So if we can repair this IPS, and then differentiate this repaired IPS into motor neuron, we can then use this motor neuron to transplant into the patient. And because the cells come from the patient, you won't have the immune rejection that you usually have for um, transplantation. So again, these are the two major applications that come up from this field, and this is the biggest of <coughs> the stem cell field. So what I wanted to tell you uh, in the next few slides is how, we do, how do we do that? And we do this in the lab all the time. So we start with a patient, a donor, a healthy donor, or someone with a disease, and we need to start with some of their cells. I mentioned skin, I will tell you <coughs> more about this. Then we need to introduce these four genes, and there are different methods to do this, I will tell you a little bit about it. And then we pick individual <coughs> colonies, and we expand them for weeks or months. And we want to make sure that they are very put on, so we have a lot of characterization to do before we can start differentiating them and using them for disease modeling. So the two things I'm going to focus on in the next few slides, which cell type and which method to introduce the, the four Yamanaka I'm going to call it the Yamanaka factor, right? So, regarding the somatic cells, um, what do we want to start with? Well, the, the first thing, we want to see cells that are easy to collect for the patients. Uh, it's much easier if we take blood and if we take um, skin biopsy. Skin biopsy is pretty easy, but still, blood is the easiest. It's also possible to get cells from urine, but it's a little bit more difficult. Uh, we also want cells that are easy to reprogram, and it was shown in the past that if you start with stem cells, it's easier to reprogram than cells that are fully differentiated T cell or lymphocytes. So that's something that uh, we should keep in mind. So in the lab, uh, when we started in 2008, so we started two years after the discovery from the Shinya Yamanaka, uh, we, most of the samples we received in the first year were skin <coughs> biopsy, so we get a little piece like this, like two, four millimeter of skin, we just chop it and put it in culture, and you see this nice fibroblast skin cells growing like this, and we can start the reprogramming from that. Now, most of the samples we receive in the lab are blood samples, so we just eliminate the red blood cells, take the, the white blood cells, put them in culture, and ready to go for the reprogramming. So very, very simple. So the next step is, well, how do we bring this four Yamanaka factor into the cell? Well, when uh, Shinya Yamanaka uh, did this the first time, he used retroviruses. So I don't know if you are familiar with retroviruses. Um, so the good thing about this is, I, I should mention one thing also. The reprogramming from skin to IPS takes about two to three weeks. So we need this uh, four Yamanaka factor, this protein, to be expressed for a long time. So I don't know if you've done any experiment where you try to express a gene in cells, but usually with a plasmid, you put the plasmid in the cells. Sorry if I'm too technical for some people, but um, it doesn't last very long. The good thing about retrovirus is it's integrated into the genome, so when the cells divide, it's still there, and you, you have the protein expressed for a long time. So that's one of the reasons it worked well for him, using this retrovirus system. But the retrovirus is integrated in the genome, which is not good because now your IPS at the end have run down pieces of virus everywhere into the genome. So there is advantages and disadvantages regarding the retroviruses. So the following years, uh, there were many other approaches that were used to introduce the four Yamanaka factors in the cells. And I'm just going to talk about one today, the Sondai virus. So there are a few specific about the Sondai virus that I will talk in the next slide. So the Sondai virus, I don't know if you've heard about it before, it's a, it's a virus from um, 
this, that was discovered in Japan in the city of Sendai. And it's a virus of mouse and rat. And it's part of this big uh, pyramid surveillance family. It has uh, RNA uh, genome. So if you know retroviruses, they have RNA genome, but they go through a DNA phase. This is an RNA genome, doesn't go through a DNA phase at all. So it's a very different type of uh, virus than the retrovirus or antiviruses. And it's a negative sense uh, single stranded RNA. And it contains six major genes, so very simple. So what you can do is, I mean, you don't do it, but people have put the four Yamanaka factor here within, the, within this um, genome. So now we have a virus that express these four Yamanaka factors. Um, briefly, I'm going to go through that. When you have the virus, when you add the virus to the cells, it goes in, the RNA is released. It's a, I mentioned it's a minus a negative uh, RNA, it turns into a plus. And then the protein are expressed. So now we have our four cells to get it to semi in the cell so they can turn into uh, IPs. And for safety reasons, these virus are modified. So there is a deletion of this fusion protein. So the virus can go in the cells, but it's not going to make more virus. So it's safe for us to use it in the lab. So now we have a tool to bring uh, the cells, to bring the, the factors into the cells. I, should, uh, I put this slide to show the advantage of the SOMA virus compared to other methods. I haven't really talked about other methods, but we tried many in the lab, you can imagine. Uh, this is our favorite. Um, and why? Well, one is because we can use it for many cell types. I mentioned that we start sometimes with blood, sometimes with skin cells. There are some methods that don't really work for blood cells, so that's a good thing. Another is very simple. You just add the virus once, and that's it. Uh, the, the other one, it's very efficient. So you have your cells, you put the virus, pretty much all the cells will have the virus. And it, it, as I mentioned, does not go through a DNA phase. And this is very important because if it goes through a DNA phase, you might have integration into the gene, and we don't want this. And it's safe, uh, first, because this um, it's not a virus that is, um, uh, goes against human. It's, it's a rat and mouse virus and because of this uh, deletion I mentioned earlier. So, how does it work? Like I said, we don't make this virus in the lab, we buy it uh, through a company, and it's like three, it comes with three little tubes like this. Uh, each one has a different type of virus, so one has KLF4 or SARS-2 together in the same virus, one has semi-coli, and one has KLF4. Again, it's like we have KLF4 twice, but they show it's more efficient when we do that. So we start in this case, it's a, just an example with skin cells. We put the cells in, into a plate at day zero. We add the virus here. So skin cells grow in their own medium. IPS grow in a different medium. And I told you it takes about two, three weeks for the cell to go from skin to IPS. <coughs> so what we do is, about a week later, we switch the culture condition from skin cell to pluripotent stem cell. And this is what I showed here. And we wait, we wait, we just put the cells and we be patient. And then after about three weeks, we get these cells here that are pluripotent stem cells. So just to show you how this goes, we took a video, or we took pictures every six hours along the way, so you have an idea of what's going on during these three weeks. We are waiting and seeing things happening. So these are skin cells. See some changes here, changes here? Well, this is not good. This is good. This is an IPS that is growing beautifully, and then we pick it, so it disappears from the thing. Yeah. One more time to... So it's amazing, the change, right? Amazing that this, all this is happening are just adding the virus in one day. That's it. Okay, so these cells are IPS, and these are the cells that you can pretty much so expand and differentiate into anything. I'm going to show you one more video where, in this case, we started with blood cells. So blood cells are tiny, brown, floating cells. Again, they were, uh, the virus was added to the cells. They're going to start attaching. Start growing, 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 growing. Oops. Right, but you have either the idea. 
So the efficiency is not great. Um, usually mm -hmm. when you get 0.1% of the cells that turn into pluripotent stem cells, you are happy. But you don't care because when you have the pluripotent stem cells, you can expand them, right? So even if it's not efficient, it's not a major problem for us. So when we have this um, um, colony that I showed you before in the video, we just pick individual ones. So we usually try to derive more than one line, like five lines for each patient. So we pick individual line, and each, line, each colony will be a line. So we expand it. We expand it all the way for probably a month until we have enough to freeze and to do the characterization. For the characterization, we want to make sure that they are pluripotent, so we check if they express markers that are specific for pluripotent stem cells. We want to make sure they differentiate into any cell type of the body. So we do some differentiation in vitro and look for markers for skin, so blood cells, muscle cells, neuron cells, etc. We want to make sure that um, they, nothing happened during the reprogramming. As far as genetic stability, this is not uncommon, unfortunately, to have extra chromosome or translocation. So we have to check, at least with cryotyping, if the cells are normal. And usually we also confirm the identity to make sure that there was no mix between lines. And if you do a lot of QC in the lab, I'm sure you're aware of this. This happened. You work with HeLa cells. HeLa cells have been swapped so many times. So it's always very important to check identity of your cells and for this, even more for us because we give these cells away then uh, to do the research. We don't want to, to leave the wrong cell. So now you're ready pretty much to start the differentiation, right? And so in the lab, we've done uh, many different cell types. I just put three slides here um, where we try to differentiate uh, IPS into motoneuron. And you can see here, so I put one example, phytoderm, isoderm, monoderm. So you can see all this connection, all this exon going from one cell to another. And by doing immunostaining for this marker that is specific for motor neuron, we show that we had the right cells here. Uh, another example for underderm, we are trying to make a pancreatic beta cell so one of the projects we have um, at HCI is to make beta cells for transplantation for patients with type 1 diabetes. We just started this, but we are putting a lot of efforts right now to make beta cells, functional beta cells. And by functional, I mean if you have glucose, they should secrete insulin. And that's very important. You might get beta cells that have the right markers, but if they don't do the things they are supposed to do, they are not. Uh, so valuable. So this is a protocol that was developed by uh, Dr. Doug Melton at uh, Harvard Center Institute. It takes a long protocol, many, many days. It's very expensive, but uh, we are able to get some beta cells which are sometimes functional. At this point, they are not always functional, so we need to optimize this protocol, but <coughs> we're getting there. It's very exciting. And again, here, we have ways to verify that these cells are the right uh, set. Uh, an example for mesoderm and so that's cool. Uh, yes. Show me a little picture as a little bit in the car earlier. We can make cardiac cells, and the cool thing about cardiac cells is they mean so you get this in your place, you check under the microscope, and so when I have a tour of the lab, that's when people are getting like super excited. Before I can talk, and they're like, ah, <laughs> this, this is. Really, really, we are very, very So, and this is uh, extremely, extremely useful for um, uh, <coughs> companies uh, they want to test drugs on cardiomyocytes. There is a big market for this uh, cell type. Mm -hmm. And there are good protocols to make this cardiomyocyte for my kids. So, it's <coughs> so um, that's about it. what I'm going to say on the differentiation. I'm going to switch gear a little bit because there were. Uh, there was a second revolution, I should say, in the past few years, besides the reprogramming and IPS derivation, is the revolution on the gene editing part. And this is big, and we are doing it in the lab, so I'm going to talk about this in the next few slides. The gene thing is pretty easy, it's just cutting and pasting. So, that's why I'm not this here. so why, why are we interested in doing this in our first constant one, one thing you can do with gene editing is knocking out the gene. So, if you want to know if the gene is important, well, remove it and see what happens in the cells. 
very easy. <laughs> so now we can do that. Another thing is a knock-in. So we can introduce mutation or repair mutation. So we can derive an IPS line for the patient with mutation and fix the mutation. And now we have two IPS lines that are identical except for this mutation. This is the best way to do uh, to, to disease modeling. And this is used by many labs now because when you do a number of control versus a number of patients, Sometimes it's a bit noisy because every single IPS line from every single donor will have the genetic background that can influence the results. So it's slightly noisy. While if you take one line without the mutation, introduce the mutation, or on the other side, one line with the mutation, repair the mutation, you have a perfect control. So a lot of labs are interested in getting this, and we have a lot of demand for this gene editing lines. Another thing super cool that we can do in the lab is uh, introducing fluorescent marker to create gene reporter lines. So this was not done by us, unfortunately. Um, this uh, lab in um, Seattle, it's uh, got the name of the lab, um, the Allen Institute. They fused GFP, so green fluorescent protein, to this um, uh, protein, so tubulin or here admin B1. So you can visualize this protein while the cells are dividing. You can see where it goes. It's really, really, really cool and very useful for many applications. One thing we, uh, we don't do this, but one thing we are very interested in doing, and we've done it for a few, uh, few uh, uh, project already, is um, putting this GFP after, like, um, uh, let's say, a protein that is specific for cardiac cells. So now you have your IPS, you differentiate them, and only the cardiac, cell, cardiac cells will turn green. So you can visualize very easily if your protocol is good or not. So these are tools, again, that are pretty new, and we can create them at the much better path than a few years ago because of the revolution of gene editing. So why is it the revolution on the gene editing part? Well, the old way to uh, modify uh, cells was just Let's put a piece of DNA and hope that some homologous recombination will happen. We've done this for years. It was very inefficient. We use it uh, using different type of uh, DNA um, introduction. Big, the back a big, big piece of DNA. I don't know if also pretty big, but it was very, very inefficient. And I would say early 2000 is when people decided to change the strategy. And what they are doing now, what we are doing now, is we introduce a DNA break. You cut the DNA at a specific place, and then you, put, you, put, you still put the piece of DNA you want to, to uh, introduce. And because of the break, the cells is gonna try to repair this break and use this piece of DNA that you introduce and do the homologous recombination. So it's a lot more efficient than it was but you have to cut in a precise locus, a precise um, uh, region, right? And we didn't have the tools for that. So in the past 10 years, four different tools have been uh, uh, described and used. One is the mega nucleases, one the zinc finger nucleases, one in the, is a talon, and the last one, which is the most exciting, is the crispr cas so all these are protein that can cut, and they were modified in some way to tell them where to cut in a very specific manner. Okay. So when we started the gene editing in the lab in 2013, we started with a talent. Six months later, we switched to the CRISPR. So it tells you how quickly the technology changes. It's crazy. It's amazing. And mega nucleases, maybe 2007, 8, same finger, 2010. So every two, three years, you have a new tool that is coming up. I would say this one is big in pretty much a um, uh, region here. So when they see the virus again the next time, let's trigger two things. Triggers the expression of this. RNA here that comes from this little piece of DNA that we incorporated from the previous encounter with the virus. And it triggers 
the synthesis of this Cas protein. So this protein are the scissors, they're going to cut the DNA. This little piece of RNA are the paste, it's going to bring the Cas9 protein right in the right place. So the virus is here, the DNA is recognized by this little piece of RNA, Cas9 comes with it and starts cutting, 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 and the virus is gone. So this is a very amazing, powerful thing that happened in bacteria. And then in 2012, 13 people are like, can we use this for genetic? It's a scissor and it's a paste. It's exactly what we want for genetic, right? So in 2012, 13, there were four publications where they engineered this cas protein and this, uh, this cas protein and this RNA to use them for genetic. And most likely, some of these people will have a Nobel Prize in the next few um, years. Um, so this is amazing. Again, using the power of nature and using this for a specific goal that we are trying to reach in the lab. So how does it work? Pretty much, like I said, there are two things. You need a protein that we cut, and one that each, I should say, each bacteria has its own Cas9 um, uh, CRISPR system. But the one that we use in the lab is one that is very simple, that's why it was chosen, and it comes from this streptococcus uh, reagents. So the protein in this case is called Cas9, but there are many, many, 12, 13, etc. And it needs this RNA to guide the Cas9 to the right place, right? So it consists in two, two pieces, one what, that is called the tracer RNA and one that is the CRISPR RNA here. So these are always the same, but this is the most important. This little part, 20 nucleotide, is what will recognize the specific region you want to cut. So in your lab, if you want to decide to cut in a specific place your gene of interest, you just have to design this 20 nucleotide and synthesize them through you know, company and that's pretty much it. So extremely, extremely easy. Much I didn't talk about talent, zinc finger and all this. They were good tools, but they were very difficult to build. This is the, the simplest, very, 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 very easy. So this 20 nucleotide RNA will recognize the DNA in the, into the genome. And the big Cas9, it's hard to see the blue, it's a big protein, all the blue stuff in the back, uh, will cut. And for the protein to cut, there is one requirement, is that there is a, this, this little sequence, this protospacer associated motif called PAM here, and it has to be right next to this 20 nucleotide. And for this protein, Cas9, it's NGG. For other protein, it's a different sequence. So that's the only, I told you it's super easy, you can design whatever you want. Well, there is one thing you have to keep in mind, it has to be NGG right after the 20 nucleotide. But that's it. So super, super easy. Am I trying to understand that one? Is your hand cut? Yeah, I'm trying to Okay. okay. So, now we have a tool to cut it in, right? And I told you, the, the way it's gonna work now is that the cells is gonna use the repair machinery to try to fix the problem. And there are two different uh, repair mechanisms. One that is called non-homologous end joining. So, you cut here, and the cell's gonna try to repair, you know, put some nucleotide together and fix it quickly. Uh, it's the most frequent way of fixing this kind of cut, but it's error prone. So very often what happens is you have some deletion or insertion, call them in Most of the time it's deletion. So now what happens is if you do this in the middle of a gene, you have a little deletion, you just you have a perfect way to do a knockout. You have a perfect way to eliminate this protein. So that's how we do the knockout. On the second type of repair here, you rely on homology recombination. So you need to bring a little piece of DNA, which is the blue here, and now the DNA repair will happen by homologous recombination, so this little piece of DNA will replace this missing part. Okay? 
So if you had a mutation here, you kept very close to the mutation, you bring a little piece of DNA that doesn't have a mutation, and it's going to be replacing this big break here, and now you have a perfect uh, DNA sequence. Okay? So these are the two main ways the cells are repairing break, in this case, break that we are creating. So just a little bit more information to make sure you understand how it works. So let's say we want to knock out the gene. We want to know what the function of this gene. So we're going to create a little RNA, a little uh, uh, protein that we cut right into the gene. And if we make only one cut, like I said earlier, it's going to try to fix it. Hopefully there will be some error. So this is what you get. So this is the sequence before cutting. And after cutting, you have some cells that have some deletion. You can see here. So some of these deletion will bring like the stop codon very early on, and the protein won't be expressed. And that's how we make a knockout. Another way to make a knockout, because the, this works pretty well, you can, instead of putting one RNA, you put two RNA. And one will cut here, one will cut here, so you make a big hole into the gene, and the protein won't be expressed. So that's another way to make a knockout. For the knocking, as I mentioned earlier, you rely on a piece of DNA that you bring at the same time that the, you know, the protein and the RNA. And hopefully the homologous recombination will happen and you get the exact uh, sequence you like. So it's more precise, but it's a um, it's rare event, so it's more difficult to obtain. So what we usually do is we have our ITS, we introduce all this, okay, and we know that only a few I mean, few cells will get the right cell. So we have to pick individual colonies coming from one cell. We pick like 300 colonies of plants. And then we screen to find out which one has the right uh, modification, the one we want. So it's pretty labor intensive still, but it's, it works very, very nicely. Now. So as an example here, if you start with a patient who has a mutation, so in this case, heterozygous mutation, you can see here uh, when you have one peak, only one nucleotide, but here you have two peaks, green and blue. So this is where the mutation is. So what we did was uh, we had a little RNA right here. We want it to be very close to the mutation. We had the protein, so the protein we cut right around this region. And we bring the piece of DNA here that hopefully will replace uh, the, the uh, refill the break here. And you can see here, we obtain one clone that has wild type, wild type, so we fix the mutation. So this is an example. We start with an IPS, that that mutation, and we fix it. So again, this is tools we didn't have a few years ago, and the combination of both reprogramming and gene editing gives us like really a, a, like great power to do disease modeling. So, I'm going to switch to the next one, this is not right. And um, first thing I would like to talk about is, well, we, before this, uh, before the derivation of IPS and, um, and gene editing, we didn't have so much um, tools to study these diseases. Uh, first, um, primary cells don't grow very long usually, so if you're interested in muscle disease, can take some muscles from the patient, but it's not so easy, right? Very limited um, primary cells, and they don't stay very long in the They don't grow forever. IPS grow forever. So limited availability of samples, especially if you are working with neurological disorder, it's very difficult to get samples from the brain. So very limited uh, uh, cells to work with. So people have used mouse model, but sometimes they don't look at it today so well in this case. Because we have to use a very different um, physiology. Mortalized cell lines have been used a lot, you know, with uh, others. But they are not always great. Um, most of them have bad carriers, but they've been pleasure forever. So they are not ideal models. So all these are not the best model for, for uh, business, for creating business model. Now, what I'm trying to convince you here, to convince you here, is that IPS have the power to uh, 
bring the DCS modeling to an upper level now. This, the first derivation of human ideas was in 2007, you remember I told you? In 2008, the first IPS from patient was derived. And you can see these are all the publications from 2008 to 2015 that, were, um, that use IPS for disease modeling. And this is 2015, so you can imagine in, in the past three years how many more publications have, have been um, uh, reported on all these disease modeling. So it's an extremely powerful tool that we have now. Um, early on, people use mostly disease, <coughs> immunology disease because they're much easier to uh, study. Usually you just have like, you know, one mutation. So like um, ALS, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis. And we can use gene editing to, um, to uh, fix the mutation. So it's a very easy model. But now I uh, see more and more publication on more complex diseases like diabetes, Down syndrome, autism. So IPS can be used for all these type of diseases, but definitely much easier to work with, uh, on monogenic diseases. So I want to give you one example now for the next, uh, last part of the talk on uh, ALS. So I don't know if you are familiar with the disease. Uh, it was first described by a Frenchman, I guess. <laughs> Uh, Jean-Martin Charcot in 1874, and um, it is a motor neuron disease. It, you have a rapid um, it's a rapid progressive disease and that causes degeneration of motor neuron and then the muscles um, um, atrophy. And uh, people die very quickly, like three uh, to five years after diagnosis. And it's also called Lou Gehrig, um, reference to a baseball player for the Yankees who had a disease. You had to bring me a little baseball, right? So this, the epidemiology of ALS, um, it's a uh, uniform worldwide distribution. <coughs> Incidence is about one to two per hundred thousand uh, people. It's <coughs> an age of answer is 40 to 60 years old. Men are more affected than women. Like I said earlier, patients die usually uh, on average three to five years from time of diagnosis. Some um, can can survive a little bit longer, but overall it's pretty pretty poor progress. And 90% of these cases are sporadic. About 10% are 10% are inherited familial case of ALS. So. It is a pretty difficult um, disease to study because there are more than 40 genes that are involved in, in this disease. And I just put here the four most uh, common um, genes that are mutated in the disease. So we have SOD1, uh, FUS, uh, C9, OF72, ITDP43. So most of the first study on ILS using IPS focus on this uh, four mutations. Interestingly, um, only two drugs are FDA approved to uh, treat the patient with AIDS. The first one was approved in December 95, and the second one in 2017. So in 22 years, only two drugs were developed for the treatment of these diseases. So it really shows that we don't have the right to get a good disease model in a dish. 22 years. So now, hopefully, we have the right um, um, cells and the right tools to do that. And I'm going to show you in the next few slides. So first, um, in 2008, IPS line were derived from patients with ALS, two patients, uh, 80 and 82 years old. So once again, I didn't mention, you can derive IPS from people from a few months to more than 100 years old. There is no uh, problem with this. And they show they start with skin cells here, and you can see that beautiful IPS line. They show that they had a mutation, this two nucleotide here, and in this publication they show that they differentiate this IPS into the world. So that's pretty much all what they did for this work, but this was very early on, 2008. Then the same group, and I should mention this group is uh, 
from Kevin Egan's what Harvard in our department. So the same group uh, published in 2014 a follow-up on this uh, first publication. So again, they had this um, ALS, uh, this IPS line from the ALS patient with this mutation in SOT1. They developed a good protocol to make motor neuron, and now they can compare the motor neuron from control healthy donor versus patient. And mostly what they found is that overall there was a lower number of motor neurons when they started this patient, uh, IPS, and they showed that it's not a proliferation problem, it's mostly the cells are back and forth. And they also found uh, a reduction of the soma size. So you can see probably here, the soma size, and here more cell base for the patient as you want to work. They did a lot more work than this, but I'm, I'm just going to uh, stop here. So by using IPS with a uh, few IPS derived from healthy donor and few IPS derived from the ALS, they can already see this difference. Now, the next step for them was to use gene editing and repair the mutation and see, well, is this because of the mutation or something else in the genome? And this is what they did here. So at the time, they used the same finger. So it was probably before 2013. They repaired this mutation in someone. And you can see here before and after repair, and this is uh, looking at the, let's see, the number of motor neurons and uh, the size, and the summer size, and the number of motor neurons. So they could rescue, by fixing the mutation, they could rescue the phenotype. Again, showing that this condition is the cause of this motor neuron problem, motor neuron RDA. So now you have perfect um, cells in a dish to study what's going on besides this difference in size. So they've done a lot more work, obviously, than what I'm showing you here. But the same year, the same, I mean, still Kevin again, but in collaboration with other people here at the Children's Hospital, they show that this motor neuron are like they have a, this hyper excitability, so they're constantly like firing, okay? And so for this, they use patch clamp, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, uh, physiology, uh, yeah, physiology uh, um, but this is what they use to check the um, neuron firing. They use IPS line from not only this uh, patient with mutation in SOD1, but different mutation, and they find for all these different mutation, the same hyper excitability of the motor neuron. Just to show you briefly one video from this paper, so these are the control, these are the patients, you can see that more like firing here, and um, based on this, uh, they had one drug that, that could fix the problem, so the next step was to test this drug, and this was, this drug was reticabine, it's a potassium channel opener, and you can see here before and after I activate it, they can reduce this hyper uh, excitability of the motor neuron. So this was in 2014, and uh, the first author here from this um, from this publication is at NGH, is a uh, neurologist there, and he started a clinical trial in 2015 to test retigabine in ALS patients. So it's been on for three years. I checked the FDA website yesterday to see where they were last year. They're still testing, so I haven't seen data from that. But from, you know, 2014 to 15, one year pretty much, to go from the dish all the way to the patient. So it's pretty amazing. And if you want to read more about that, there is this review from all these people involved in the work that goes, that uh, uh, summarizes pretty much the story that I told you here, from dish to bedside. And I think it's a pretty uh, uh, good thing to, uh, to read, to have an idea again of how things went. And I'll probably show you only the good thing here. There are a lot of <laughs> difficult things along the way, but uh, I still think uh, it is very encouraging to me to see how quickly we can go from you know, taking blood cells or skin cells from the patient to uh, develop a new drug. And um, this month in Nature Medicine, there is a new publication, again, uh, using IQ.
Q is derived from LS and they identify the potential purification again. So in four years, we already had two drugs, while before that, we had 20 years between the two different drugs. So uh, I think I, I mean, I hope I convinced you that we have like really new, exciting tools that um, can change really the way we do research and drug development. The companies are really, really interested now in using this. Uh, there's still a lot of challenging challenges, sorry, and cases are difficult to capture, not always uh, behaving the way we want, uh, but it's still like a really, really interesting time to start some research. So this is the lab pretty much uh, here. This is our building, and these are colorful cells that I think we make, and we are HSMA as well. I take questions anytime. Thank you.